What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we're covering the most disturbing story you've probably never heard of. The disappearance of Mary Bobo Shin. Mary Jimmy Shin was born January 11, 1953, to Gresham and Mary Sue Shin in Magnolia, Arkansas. Her family and friends referred to her affectionately as Bobo. She had four siblings, including a sister named Rebecca, who was five years older. She had a normal, ordinary upbringing and graduated from Magnolia High School in the early 70s. Bobo then went on to attend Southern Arkansas University, where she graduated in 1976. Bobo began a career as an art teacher while working in real estate on the side. On July 20th, 1978, she told some friends she was going to meet a man who had seen her ad in the newspaper and was interested in buying a house she had renovated. Bobo was never heard from again. On that hot summer day in 1978, she vanished without a trace. Cliff Knowles was a dispatcher at the Magnolia Police Department who had also gone to school with Bobo. He was working that day when Bobo's mother, Mary Sue, walked in the door. She walked in and she looked worried. So I asked, Mrs. Shin, are you all right? And she said, well, I'm worried about Bobo. Mr. Knowles had relayed that information to KTAL Fox 16 News in 2018. Bobo's body has never been found. Bobo's car was found behind a grocery store shortly after she disappeared. Her belongings, including her shoes and purse, were in the car along with dirt, grass, and gravel. The keys were in the car, and the windows were rolled down. Fingerprints found inside the car have yet to be identified. Both Bobo's parents, as well as her sister, have all passed away now. Both her parents died not knowing what happened to their daughter. That hurts me more than anything, thinking about that, Knowles told KTAL. Come looking for me. One of the last people to speak to Bobo before she disappeared was her friend Anita, who called her around 11 a.m. that morning to invite her to come over. Bobo explained to her that she was waiting for a call from a man who was interested in buying the house she had flipped. Five minutes later, Anita's phone rang. It was Bobo, who said the man called and said he had a house out of town he was interested in trading. His car was being worked on at the Pontiac dealership, so they were going to meet at the Easy Mart and they'd come over when she was finished. Come looking for me if I'm not back this afternoon, she said in a joking way before hanging up. An unnamed employee at a local Pontiac dealership was closing up for the night when a woman approached him, frantic with worry. That woman was Bobo's mother, Mary Sue. She explained that she was worried about her daughter who never made it home for supper Bobo lived with her parents. Mary Sue came to the dealership because that's where Bobo told her the man's car was being worked on. She hoped that finding that man would help her find her daughter. The employee confirmed that there were no cars in the shop that could belong to the man. But he did see a car picking up a man at the Easy Mart around noon. The car he described matched the blue 1976 Buick that Bobo drove. Mary Sue left, and the employee got in his car to drive home for the night. As he passed a local grocery store called Smitty's, he noticed a blue 1976 Buick sitting in the parking lot. He pulled in and started looking around, opened the driver's side door, and sat down. He opened the middle console and noticed some paperwork with her name on it. He immediately decided to track Mary Sue down to give her the information, at which point, Mary Sue went straight to the police. Timeline. Bobo got up that morning, went for a walk, and then went to her art studio to teach a class. At 11 a.m., she spoke to her friend Anita. A minute or so later, she talked to the man who told her he had a house outside of town that he was interested in trading. An employee at Easy Mart reported having seen a man come in to get change for the payphone around 11 a.m. They said he had dark hair, and was wearing a white t-shirt and jeans. A carpenter working on a house across the street from the one Bobo was trying to sell reported having seen a woman matching her description arrive at the home around 11.30 a.m. 
A few minutes later, a man pulled up in a dark green Pontiac. The two of them went into the house, they came back out, got in their own cars, and left in the same direction. He said the man was in his mid to late 20s, was six feet tall with brown hair, a mustache and beard, and wearing a ball cap. The employee at the Pontiac dealership said he saw a car matching Bobo's pick up a man at the Easy Mart around noon. That seemed to contradict the carpenter's timeline of seeing them at the house at 11.30 a.m. Why would they leave the house in separate cars, only for her to pick him up 30 minutes later at the Easy Mart? It's possible that either the carpenter or the Pontiac employee were off about the time or about who they saw. After all, they were just casual observers with no idea they might be witnessing to something sinister. A man named Henry Irwin told police he had been out on his land bailing hay that day when he spotted a car that looked like Bobo's drive by, weaving back and forth as a man and woman inside appeared to struggle. Some of the employees of Smitty's grocery store said they first noticed a car sitting in the parking lot at around 1.30 p.m. Police narrowed in on the time frame between 12 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. to try to determine what happened to Bobo. Unfortunately, the case has never been solved. Bobo was eventually declared dead. Michael G. Morse A few months after Bobo disappeared, a man named Michael G. Morse committed suicide in the woods. He lived in the next county and matched the physical description of the man witnesses had seen. Bobo's father was frustrated with how the investigation was going, so he hired a private investigator by the name of William Deere. They chose him because he worked on another high-profile case of a teenager named James Dallas Egbert II. One of the first things Deere did was speak to Morse's employer, who told him Morse had taken that day off to visit someone in Magnolia about real estate. The carpenter, who was working on the house across the street, was shown a picture of Morse and claimed it was the same man he had seen that day. The carpenter wrote an official statement to the sheriff with his claim. The sheriff dismissed it because it had been over a year by that point, and he didn't think it was possible to recognize someone he had seen only for a few minutes over a year ago. Further investigation revealed Morse had been previously diagnosed with schizophrenia, was on antipsychotic medication, and was seeing a psychiatrist. People who knew him claimed he had a fascination with the case, and insisted on more than one occasion that he had insider information. Since it was no longer possible to question Morse, there was very little else for either Deere or the police department to work with to solve the case. A local psychic claimed that Morse buried Bobo on top of his father's coffin in the Western Cemetery. With nothing else to go on and desperate for answers, Deere obtained permission from the Morse family to exhume the father's grave. Local officials got on board with the plan. They all gathered around anxiously at the grave on a day in November in 1979. Once the coffin was reached, it became clear there wasn't another body on top of the coffin. A short time later, the Morse family sued Deer for $2 million on the grounds of emotional duress and invasion of privacy. They claimed that he had engaged in extreme and outrageous conduct from bizarre sources such as a psychic and others. Deer claimed his sources of information about the grave was never a psychic at all. He claimed he made that up to protect the identity of the real source, who overheard Morse talking to his psychiatrist. It was later revealed the anonymous source was a nurse who worked for the psychiatrist. She claimed she heard Morse tell the psychiatrist that he buried her with his father. The lawsuit ended up in court in front of a jury who sided with Deer. He stopped officially working on the Bobo Shin case and moved to Texas. Privately, though, he never completely gave up. Sheriff Mike Lowe Sheriff Lowe and William Deere never did get along. From the moment Deere joined the investigation, the two men started stepping on each other's toes. Lowe had known Bobo personally, and because he was emotionally invested in the case, he was working even harder to solve it. He felt Deere was haughty and arrogant, and resented the outsider pushing his way onto the case. From Deere's point of view, the police were getting in the way of his investigation. They constantly butted heads until Deere eventually stopped working on the case and moved to Texas. However, unlike Deere, Lowe never gave up on the case, even as he neared retirement. In fact, in 2015, 
he decided to reopen the investigation and start from scratch. While still using some original information, such as the contents of the car, he even tracked down surviving witnesses and interviewed them again. In an interview with Arkansas Life, Sheriff Lowe said, the community deserves an answer. The family deserves an answer. So I've made it my decision to solve it. It's the only case I've ever gotten so personally involved with and the only one I ever will because it takes a toll on you. William Deer. Around 2016, William Deer received a phone call for someone who wished to remain anonymous. The person said they had details to share about the Bobo Shin case. They suspected they knew of a person who was still alive, who was involved in her disappearance. They gathered from things they had seen and heard that her body was on some land outside of town. Deer tried to contact Sheriff Lowe, but was immediately told by email that any information had to be given to the county prosecutor. Deer believed that would lead nowhere, so he continued working on it privately while Lowe continued with his reopening of the investigation. The two men had never been able to see eye to eye, which never changed, even after many years. Memorial Service In July 2014, 36 years after Bobo's disappearance, family and friends held a memorial service for her at Central Baptist Church in Magnolia. Her parents had already passed away, but her four siblings decided it was time to do something to get closure for the rest of the family. A marker with her name was placed next to her parents' headstones, and the church became filled with people who had known and loved her. They took turns sharing stories, singing songs, and watching a video montage of a life that was cut short. There were a lot of tears as they remembered and grieved the young woman they had known so long ago. Pastor Joe Stubblefield, who had been the pastor at the time of her disappearance, summed it up the best way anyone could. We may not know in this lifetime what happened to Bobo, but we are assured in scripture there's nothing hidden that would not be revealed. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist will pop up right now with more videos you'll love. See you guys next time.